Okay, first of all, I'm going to say to you, I apologise in advance if I drop any bombs where I say, um, accidentally say Star Wars instead of Star Trek. <laughs> Um, I was. Uh, I will explain later on, but yeah, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge Star Trek and um, Star Wars fan. I do love Star Trek as well, but I, I, I apologise now if I make any Freudian slips towards that. <laughs> oh yeah, well, it's it's a very common mistake. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Last Movie Outpost. I'm your host today, not George Lucas, and with us we have a very special guest, um, and it is Roger Nygaard. Hello. Hey, great to be here. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you may know Roger's name, but uh, just to give you a brief history of what he has worked on is he has served as an editor on programs like Curb Your Enthusiasm, Veep, Grey's Anatomy, Who is America, and The Comedy Store. He has directed episodes of The Bernie Mac Show and... Uh, the Office. He has done documentaries like The Truth About Marriage, The Nature of Existence, and also, very famously, Trekkies, Parts 1 and 2, and worked on films like High Strung and Suckers. And it's interesting that High Strung is one of those films that we had a retro review on the last movie, Outpost. Um, what was that about? What was the film about? What was High Strung about? Well, it was a comedy set in one room about one guy complaining about everything in the world that bothered him. And he wouldn't leave his room. He wouldn't leave his apartment because uh, he was, you know, basically uh, hated the world until he was haunted by this specter of death saying your time is coming. And we cast the, the role of death with Jim Carrey before Jim blew up and became huge. And also that the film is where I met Denise Crosby, who plays a character who I later it was her idea to make Trekkies. But that's where right. we first met was on High Strung. So it was kind of a pivotal film. It was uh, Kirsten Dunst had, uh, was one of her earliest films. She was six years old in wow. the film. Um, Thomas F. Wilson, who plays Biff in Back to the Future, was in the film. Janie Lane, the lead singer of the band Warrant, has a cameo. So it was uh, it was my first feature, and it was kind of a, a, a confluence of meeting points for a lot of people. Yeah, it's, it sounds incredible. And I know the review that we had on there made it sound really interesting. The downside of it is, is it's very difficult to get hold of, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's never been restored yet. I mean, I have a standard def copy version of it on my Vimeo site, and that's about as good as it gets for now. Oh, no, but it's certainly something to worth looking looking out for. Like I say, I also, I'm quite a fan of Steve Odekirk as well. I did like his um, Kung Pao. Uh, yeah, he well, he wrote it and stars in it, obviously. And he, when I first met Steve, he was a stand-up comedian at the Comedy Store. Okay. And I was working for some talent managers, and he had this screenplay, and he let me read it. He was intending to direct it himself, trying to raise the money, and he had been unsuccessful. And I said, hey, Steve, let me try. If I can raise enough money to shoot it, why don't you let me direct it? And he said, okay. And I don't, I don't think he believed me. He didn't think I was <laughs> going to be able to do it. And I actually found a guy, an investor, uh, a, a guy named Serge. Um, a couple of Russians who read the script and liked it, and he, Serge wrote a check. It didn't bounce. We made the film. <laughs> it turned out later that Serge, he made his money through some kind of a Medicare scam that he was running in New York, and eventually the feds chased him out of the country and under multiple indictments, and they finally found him many years later holed up in a monastery in Greece. Goodness. Goodness me. <laughs> That's um, goodness. Yeah. And so, yeah, but at the end of the day, the film was made. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, as so a filmmaker, you don't ask the guy who's giving <laughs> you your budget. Hey, where did you get your money? You just go, hey, we've got a budget. The check it mounts. Hooray. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, I mean, am I right in saying that you started off as a director first and then you sort of moved in towards editing? Is that right? Well, yeah. I mean, I started making films when I was seven eight, nine, 10 years old when I found my dad's eight millimeter movie camera and I just never really stopped. I mean, the, the films got more, uh, uh, over time they got more complex, but really not much more sophisticated. They're still just goofy with a higher budget. And at I must, some point, I, must admit, I was going to say, I have watched them from your website <laughs> and they are, they are fantastic. I, I, as I said to you, I deal with 8mm quite a lot still because I still transfer it for people. And most of the stuff that I see is weddings and holidays in Spain. So to actually see special effects and people getting shot and, and, and bodies coming off 
um, bridges and stuff was it was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that that body, we, you know, it got a lot of use. Essentially, I just we just took a pair of pants and a shirt and stuffed them full of crumpled up newspapers, got a styrofoam head, built this fake dummy. And then we would build a story around the fact that we had a dummy. And so, OK, <laughs> you're going to jump off a bridge or you're going to ride a bicycle off a bridge or you're going to get blown up. And, and so that was the extent of my storytelling in the early days, which sort of mirrored what happened in the early days of cinema in that mm. most of my, my stories were chase films. One person is chasing another for some reason. And if you look at all the old films by Buster Keaton, uh, Charlie Chaplin, the Keystone Cops, there's a lot of chasing going on because that's yeah. the easiest story to tell without dialogue in the silent yeah. film era. Yeah, I see again, I was born on Ray, raised on Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd and all those kind of things. My dad had an eight millimeter. I've still got in the background um, some eight millimeter projectors there um, and stuff. And like I say, I grew up in a small cinema where I used to watch all sorts with dad. And like you say, it's the easiest form of storytelling because you just don't need that much dialogue. Yeah, one person's got the MacGuffin, the other one wants it. Here you go. You're off to the story. So just to answer the question you answered a moment ago, I started out as a filmmaker, and that's sort of the thesis of my book, Cut to the Monkey, is that editors should not, you shouldn't be an, you should not be an editor who cuts films. You should be a filmmaker who edits. Learn your craft, learn all aspects of the craft, make short films and learn what it means to be a filmmaker, to be a storyteller. Yeah. And then if eventually you're going to focus in on a discipline where you to be successful in the business, you need to become the best at something. You need to become an expert so that you can compete with everybody else out there who wants these jobs. And over time, I learned writing, directing, producing, editing. And I have, as time went on, have focused on the editing that's gotten to be the most of my job offers. I mean, I still write and direct and produce and I do all these things, but editing is what I do mostly lately because everybody wants to pay me to do it <laughs> because it's hard to find good editors who can cut comedy and comedy editors make more than drama editors because they're in shorter supply. And the reason is that with a drama, you don't have to be quite as on your game. It's still dramatic, even if it's off by a few frames. Whereas with comedy, if it's not funny, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be really sharp. Your skills have to be really sharp to cut comedy. So, yeah, I mean, again, I completely understand what you're saying there, that when, when it comes to sort of comedy timing, I do remember the sort of, I mean, they're probably not names big to you, but like in, in the UK, we have people like Morecambe and Wise who were a comedy duo, but they cut their teeth going through all the sort of clubs and pubs before they got to TV and they, they rehearsed every single moment and you could see that their timing was was perfect. And you're saying that with with comedy that, like you say, bad timing can completely throw it out. Yes. I mean, it's deceptively difficult to cut comedy. And that's why I wrote the book was to explain sort of an editor's cookbook. Here's how you do it. It's really actually like a mathematical formula. Right. And you, it's, which is very easy to learn. And if you don't know these things, you're going to be at a disadvantage to all those who are ahead of you and, and have mastered these skills. And you, you want to compete. You want job offers. You want to get paid more. You want to work on the better shows. You want to move up from soul crushing reality maybe <laughs> to something more fulfilling like you know narrative features or yeah. you know whatever it is that you have your eyes set on your goals set on and you can do it but you need to get past the basic pitfalls that no one's taught you yet right mm -hmm. trial and error i learned a lot of this by trial and error and by watching and learning from larry david or judd apatow and sasha baron cohen and i realized one day i had these people all in a room with me trapped in this little room editing their projects. And I thought I should interrogate them and ask them why they think something is funny or not funny, which is what I did. And, you know, cut to two years later, I had a book done where I had collected all their wisdom along with what I had learned in this how to uh, manual for writing, editing, producing comedy, um, in, whether it's TV or films. Fantastic. I have actually got the book, which is called Cut to the Monkey. Uh, as I just said to you, annoyingly, it only turned up yesterday. So please don't ask me what my favorite part is yet, because I, I haven't got there. Why is it called Cut to the Monkey? <laughs> there is this thing when you're an editor, you find you need to cut to something somewhere. Usually at some point you're going to be trapped because you need to get from A to C and there's a mismatch or a continuity problem. And you look for something to cut to to bridge the gap. 
And it can be anything like a, uh, a, the TV screen or an iPhone or a person or a baby, a reaction shot. The one thing that's the best possible cutaway is a monkey. If there's a monkey in the scene, you can cut to a monkey at any time because no matter when you look at a monkey, they're always doing something interesting. Right. They're naturally funny. <laughs> it's the best cutaway you can possibly have is a monkey. So cut to the monkey. It's sort of like it's your go-to. It's one of the, the best go-to. And it, I noticed there's a lot of monkeys turning up in comedies also. Inspector Clouseau, you know, uh, deals yeah. has to deal with a monkey uh, because they're funny. And why is it they're funny? I asked Judd Apatow about that, and he said that um, a lot of times he they would he would like to put in his films or the filmmakers he was working with would put a, a wild animal into a scene. And the reason that it's funny when there's a wild animal or a monkey or a baby someone or something in a scene that doesn't respect the rules of society that means they're going to break right. the they could break the rules at any second and then that leads to comedy uh yes which is very true they say don't work with animals or children and often you will see these outtakes on programs where you see the reason why because like you say they don't respect any of the the rules that are going on um briefly to touch on some of the other documentaries that you've done uh the um where was it the truth about marriage. Tell us about that. I tend to pick topics that are really obsessing me or, or confusing me. And I had just finished a documentary about existentialism, if you could imagine. And I needed a topic that was even more challenging than the nature of the universe itself. And so <laughs> I realized marriage, of course, <laughs> even more inexplicable than existence, existence itself. And Good documentaries start out with a premise or an idea, a question that you ask at the beginning, which is essentially a mystery that you're going to solve by the end of the documentary, mm -hmm. the concept documentaries, because there's really two kinds. There's narrative documentaries where you follow one person or a small group of people to see what happens to them by the end. Do they win the big game? Is What's the verdict? Do they find what they're looking for? What have you. But in concept documentaries like Food, Inc. Uh, or the, nature, the Truth About Marriage, my film, my question at the beginning, the mystery I'm going to solve is why are relationships so hard for human beings? And are they hard? Well, 50% of them fail by definition because they end in divorce. And if you were designing a product with a 50% failure rate, we would yeah. say, go back to the drawing board. Yet yeah. everyone's clamoring for this product of marriage for some reason, even though it's so severely flawed in its design. So I set out to solve that mystery, which I do by the end. Okay. Well, don't spoil it because again, it's on my list of <laughs> list of things to watch. Is that available on streaming at the moment? It is. Yeah, Amazon or wherever any any of your favorite streamers should probably have it. That's good. Uh, again, it kind of like I say. Obviously, this interview came up a little late, and um, it was only last week that we organised it. And um, I am an avid film watcher, but my watch list grows ever longer every day. Unfortunately. <laughs> now let's get on to. The um, what I did find was interesting because I did watch it last year was Trekkies. Now, how did that come about? You said that you met Denise Crosby, um, but how did the actual movie come about? Well, Denise and I had worked together on High Strung and stayed in touch over the years, and we're, we're friends. And at one point, she she was telling we were having lunch, I think, and she was telling me about these conventions that she would attend because she was Tasha Yar on Star Trek: The Next Generation in the first early season and a half or whatever it was, and. She said, man, these Star Trek conventions are wild. I said, what do you mean? Well, the people are just, uh, it's hard to explain. It's, they're funny, they're unusual, they're amazing, they're interesting. They're, it, and she would tell me stories of the people she met. And, and I said, this is crazy. We should, and she said, it was her idea. She said, we should make a documentary about this. And my first reaction was, I can't believe no one's done that. I mean, of course, it's so obvious. And we, 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 checked no one had done anything like that in fact no one had really done a fan documentary of any kind at that point in uh, 1995 seven. end of 95 early oh, right, 96 yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah it came out in 97 didn't it sorry yeah well, if we started doing film festivals in 97 and then once we sold the film to paramount they released it in 1999 right so yeah that was the origin denise thought of it. And so we, we never made a documentary. We didn't know, I, I had never had an interest or a desire or had thought I would be, make documentaries and neither had she, but I went to this local video store, picked up some videos and Denise and I sat and watched documentaries and took notes and started learning by watching, absorbing. We watched Crumb, Hoop Dreams, uh, 
my brother's keeper, Roger and me, and started looking at what they were doing and trying to learn. And so Trekkies is really a very flawed documentary because we were novice documentarians. But now because it's become so successful, everyone's copying the flaws. And that became the prototype for fan documentaries in many ways. <laughs> Do you think it was kind of almost then a launch of the, I don't want to say the mockumentary, but obviously, because, I mean, you know, you've worked on things like Curb Your Enthusiasm and The Office. Those are done in that kind of style, but in a comedy sense. I know when the original Office started over here, the, the main character, Richie Cav Ricky Gervais, plays um, David Brent, and people actually wrote into the BBC when he got fired as lawyers saying, well, I disagree with this, not realising it was a mockumentary, but thought it was a, a, a live thing. And so do you think that was kind of the start of that? You know, that because, again, I can't think of where those kind of mockumentaries really started. It's certainly, you know, one factor. I'm sure you can look back and find many factors. But the reason Trekkies is funny and it is the way it is, is because my way of approaching a documentary at the time, having never made a documentary and essentially able to design a style that uh, out of out of ignorance was I wanted to make a film that was really entertaining first. That's my only goal. I'm, I was not a Star Trek aficionado. I mean, I liked sci-fi and I liked Star. I'd watched Star Trek growing up, but I'd also watched many sci-fi shows like Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and Time Tunnel, The Immortal, um, The Invaders, Battlestar Galactica. I, all, I, but in Star Trek was just one of them. And, and so I didn't have an agenda to try to say, hey, everyone, look how great Star Trek is. Right. My goal was only, wow, look at how interesting this group of people are who are so obsessed about something. Yeah. I'm an outsider looking in, trying to find the humor in humanity. While I also didn't want anyone who took part in the documentary to feel bad about their participation. I wanted anyone who was watching it, whether they were in the film or not in the film, to laugh with who's yeah. on camera, not at them. We wanted people to be adults who make their point, and then it's a good point or a bad point. It's up to them, and the audience decides for themselves. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? And part of the reason I think that there's a very positive reaction to the film, in addition to it being really funny, is because Denise and I both really liked our subject. We liked these people, and I think that comes through. You know, we think they're great because – we felt what I learned was there are worse things to be obsessed with than yeah. a TV show that has at its core, the prime directive mm. and, you know, being tolerant of other cultures and showing a future. That's a positive vision of humanity where most, if not all other science fiction at the time showed a decrepit decaying negative mm. version of the future where things were worse dystopian future. Star Trek was unique in that it showed a positive utopian future where everyone's going forth boldly exploring mm. men and women are equal and there's ma male captains female captains and uh, the disabled are the, the the blind man is flying the ship everyone is involved everyone's in equal everyone's invited and it was the same at conventions everyone was invited no one yeah. was turned away for being different no. everyone's embraced and that was sort of that comes through in the the people that we profiled and as part of the the moral of the story you know the ending of the film is just what you discover in trekkies is you know what these people aren't so bad after all yeah um i do remember that i, I particularly remember the comedian at the end i forget his name but he compared it to football players and i mean particularly in the uk football is soccer as you know it um but i mean there are people who do dress up in the uniforms but go with the full intent of just beating up the other people and that's just not a good message to get across whereas people who are star trek fans sci-fi fans of whatever order you know they're not hurting anybody. They're just enjoying something. And like you say, with Star Trek, it had a wonderful message of about equality to everybody long before uh, Hollywood has sort of turned that way nowadays, but they seem to sort of, I don't know whether it's gone to another extreme where it's kind of overly ex in in inclusive, but it's, it, like I say, the message that they send with, with the trackies is just, it was wonderful. And that's what people grasp onto. And the mistake that, some other fan films that came after us made is that they were made by adherents to whatever they were profiling. And so they were advocates and they were preaching, look how great this thing is. And there's, 
you won't put people to sleep any faster than if you start preaching to them. Yeah. And and so it's more entertaining when it's an outsider looking in, mm. learning about something, and then because that's what the viewer is. The viewer is going yeah. along, they're seeing it through your eyes, and they uh, can identify with you as the filmmaker better than if it's essentially it's a home movie if it's if it's made by fans for fans and it's just kind of a home movie and it doesn't cross over whereas trekkies really crossed over i think and that was the reason why mm. now i wasn't able to find a copy of trekkies 2 but tell us about that yeah it led to a sequel we pitched paramount hey we'd like to do a follow-up seven years later and they said yes we were kind of surprised when they said yes <laughs> okay well i guess we have to go do it now <laughs> and we checked in on some of the original profilees from trekkies one to see right. what where they were seven years later what they were up to and we went international because the first film was essentially just the united states and, yeah. and canada and so we looked for star trek fans around the world including the uk went to france germany brazil we went to the locations where they were the they were more, more most concentrated. We found they were everywhere, but we uh, it was a little travel log to see what Star Trek fandom was like worldwide. Brilliant. Now, in line with that, something maybe that's a little controversial in that um, our last live stream of the last movie outpost was who's had it worst, Star Wars fans or Star Trek fans? Because I've always considered myself a Star Wars fan. I grew up, like I say, in an 8mm cinema, and one of my first ever memories was watching Star Wars with, with my dad in the, in the little cinema that we had. The Disney films, I am not so much of a fan of. I do think that they are preachy, and they are putting that message across. Do you think if there was a Trekkies 3, it would be a different story that you'd be telling now? We are brainstorming a Trekkies three, Denise and oh, I. We've been we've been knocking ideas around. We've got some good, really good ideas, I think, for Trekkies three. And one reason is it's it's changed quite a bit over the years, Absolutely. and there there's a whole new subset of fandom of fans that have grown because of the new TV shows and the new movies and what they love to do. One thing they love to do is to to, to debate and argue about which what's the best version of Star Trek and which movies work and which what's canon, what's not canon. And so there's always plenty to talk about. Yeah. And so, yeah, don't be surprised if you see Trekkies three come down the road in a year or two. No, 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 not at all. And like I say, if and when it does come out, please reach out to us because, like I say, because we'd love to cover it. Because I know um, one of our other um, contributors from the last movie I posted calls himself Drunken Yoda. Uh, he is a huge Star Trek fan. And, I mean, he's done uh, sort of half an hour long videos on the original series because, he, you know, he genuinely loves them. Um, and the same with me. Like I say, I'm a Star Wars fan, but <clears throat> I, I still love Star Trek. I still remember going to the cinema. I think they had... Um, numbers one, two, three, and four shown one day in the cinema. And I remember going to see it with a friend of mine and it was, it was fantastic. If you had the chance, then again, this is just throwing this out there just to be controversial. But I mean, if you had the chance to make a star Wars film of the same thing, star Warian fans, would you do it? Well, I wouldn't say no. I, I mean, it all depends on what can I bring to it? Right. And there's been one done star Woods has been made. Yeah. And I know the guy that made that and he, 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 it's a great film and it's a little bit different. The star Trek is really unique and it's fandom is unique and there's a reason for it. Why are star Wars fans? Are, are they any less interesting? I mean, what I look for is obsession. It's really a profile of obsession. Six Days in Roswell, my documentary about UFO fanatics is also a profile of obsession. People obsessed with UFOs. And that's what's interesting is how they express that obsession with something. Why are you so into this TV show? And you see how they do it, right? There was the, the guy who made turn his entire flat into a spaceship yeah. in, in, in London, you know, when yeah. we, we interviewed him. Why would you do that? I mean, he went to the point of covering up all his windows to keep it dark enough like a spaceship. He said he kept one window to the outside through the bathroom just to make sure he had enough oxygen. <laughs> it wouldn't expire. So it's, it's not so much to the obsession that where he wants to kill himself. He's, he's still thinking about, yes, I still need things like oxygen to live. <laughs> he was mindful of survival while at the same time wanting to express himself so to such an extreme level, he turned his, his living area into a transporter 
and there was nowhere for him to sleep. So the, the bed was hidden and he would pull the bed out at night, you know, and put it on the transporter coils and sleep there, I think. It is, again, it's kind of, it, it is strange. I mean, I would say that, that there is a difference between the Star Wars fans and the Star Trek fans. Like you say, they are two different two different groups of people. I've never had an issue with either of them. Um, like I say, I, I like Star Wars more, but I've never had an issue with, with them. But some people take it to an extreme where it's kind of, you know, if you mention Star Wars and a Star Trek thing, they, they, they go absolutely crazy over it. Again, is that just part of the obsession, do you think? Well, they're different universes with different philosophies hmm. in, 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 uh, that underlies the storytelling. And Star Trek is us in the future. Star Wars is a different universe in a faraway place, and which is retelling the feudal stories of uh, from which it was borrowed when yeah. Lucas borrowed the story uh, from Japanese storytelling about yeah. samurais. Yeah. So they're just the underpinnings are different, and that leads to. The differences in fandom because yeah. it's based on the frame when the framework of a you, you can build two houses give someone the same materials and so you start with the framework and if the framework of one house is vastly different from the framework of another no matter how what kind of ornamentation you put on that framework the framing and the basis is what leads to what that house becomes mm -hmm. and it's, so it's the same with storytelling they're both great fun interesting great you know exciting stories to tell but they have different underlying philosophies within the stories. I think I remember somebody always saying that Star Trek is science fiction, whereas Star Wars was science fantasy, obviously, because like you say, you know, Star Trek is, is a way that it is somewhere in the hu future that humans could get to a point where we start doing that. We start exploring the universe and who knows what's out there. Whereas Star Wars was obviously just a, a fantasy story, like you say, borrowed from, from Japanese mythology <laughs> and, and put together. That's a great way of putting it too. I like that. Yeah, thank you. You can use that in Trek E3. <laughs> <laughs> I'll um, be surprised if we do. <laughs> and so um not not to not to wrap it up, but we are going to put up a link to your book, um, Cut to the Monkey, which I will get a review up eventually when I get around to reading it. Unfortunately, I'm I'm mildly dyslexic, so it does take me a while, but I'm I'm really looking forward to it. When you said that there's a, almost a formula to sort of comedy editing, do you think it's also something that is natural that some people are just like for example sasha baron cohen obviously he's been huge over here in the uk with some of the characters that he's done do you think that some people like him are just naturally funny and naturally understand the timing of comedy that's a great question i, I actually addressed that in the book and yes there's an innate part of the formula some people are the class clowns mm -hmm. right and so they've got a head start and that's the direction that they're pointed from the beginning but can anyone learn to run the example? One example I give is that Usain Bolt at, at some point was the fastest person in the world. He could run faster than anyone. Mm -hmm. And he, he started with a natural baseline of being able, able to run fast, but he could still get faster by practicing. And that's why he had a trainer who could help him get better. And you can get better at whatever you set out to do no matter where your baseline is, you can become much better at editing. And I, that my book shows here is how you do it. It's, it's your trainer. If you're aware of these things and you practice these things. So yes, anyone can be funnier. You can be much funnier. There are simple things like the, the punchline has to come last. And that seems obvious in <laughs> hindsight, but many yeah. times I would find when I'm editing, they have the punchline in the middle of the sentence. So I would move it around and put the funniest part last. Mm. And uh, I'll give you a, a couple of specifics. When editing, if you want it to be funnier, you use the wider takes. So you can see body language right. because someone might be standing awkwardly and that's funny. But if you cut tight, you can't see that and you lose that humor. And you want to be tight in a close up on the face for drama because that's where the emotion is. So you cut close for drama and cut wider for the funny moments. That's one very specific thing that if you're not aware of, you, why won't this scene be, this scene should be funnier. And you can make it 15% funnier by looking for the wider shots. Another thing is faster comedy is funnier comedy. The, the, and it's like concise writing is good writing. It's the same with a joke. The, the more concisely you can present the, the string between the setup and the punchline, 
the funnier the punchline will land. Mm -hmm. The more distractions you put in between those two or diversions or what I call word baggage, I clean out all the ums and you knows and the pauses. You never want to pause in a comedy unless you determine that pausing will be funnier yeah. to pause. Otherwise, you want to keep it going, get on to the next thing. Otherwise, you'll lose your audience. Either you'll test their patience. And so things that are unrelated or tangential that don't advance the story or don't help set up or land a punchline, I will trim those things away. I mean, people add the words look and listen when they speak. You know, look, I'm going to go in the other room. Well, you don't need to say, look, just say, I'm going to go in the other room. And <laughs> yeah. it's, it's sort of an, an announcement. They, it's like clearing your throat saying, I'm about to speak, pay attention to me. So I, I, I eliminate the announcements. I, I trim those away. And then things flow more elegantly when I get rid of these word barnacles and scenes flow more smoothly and punchlines are 15% funnier, you know, when you get rid of that stuff. Fair enough. Do you do you think that just hearing listen to you talk then, do you think that the art of comedy is something which is, I don't want to say lacking in today's society, but I mean, again, I grew up on things like you, I mean, you may have heard of Faulty Towers, um, which is a classic British comedy. And again, it was written by the guys from or one of the guys from Monty Python. And, and I, again, there's I, nothing funnier in TV history than when John Cleese whips his car <laughs> with a stick because he's so <laughs> up, so furious that it has conked out on him when he's trying to deliver that that cake. I've never seen anything funnier than that moment. Again, it's funny because I've seen John Cleese doing interviews about that and they said that they had different sticks and they had different timings and everything else, but the timing of it works so well because he goes off and then just comes back in like a good sort of five or six seconds later with the, the stick. He leaves frame, right? He leaves yeah. frame. There's an empty yeah. frame and he goes, right, that's it. I've had it. <laughs> he leaves frame, comes back and whips the car and it's um, brilliantly funny. And I mean, with it is, I'm glad you've heard of it because I know some Americans haven't haven't heard of it. I know that they've they've tried watching the American version, which I haven't heard, sort of seen, but I've heard it's not as good. But you think about that was like 1979, I think it was 78, 79. Do you think that comedy nowadays is? <sighs> I don't want to say more gross, but I mean, it just seems to me with some of the comedies that come out, as long as you've got lots of swearing and sex jokes, that kind of is funny. Whereas with something like 40 Towers, it's just brilliantly written. Do you think that's the case or? Well, there's always the same amount of funny people every generation. I don't think that changes. And like John Cleese was a master of delivery. He was his body language. He was a master of presenting funny personas. Hmm. Someone else delivering that, trying to deliver that same scene may not have succeeded at being funny. It, it could be boring if it's not done in a charismatic way. Hmm. So I give the credit to John Cleese for why Faulty Towers is so funny. Today, part of the uh, challenge is everyone has to do surpass what came before and yeah. sasha baron cohen is constantly trying to find something that's that that's never been seen before mm -hmm. he's he's like a, a, a technician a, a scientist of comedy mm -hmm. he will when he shoots his scenes he'll be trying a lot of different things and then in the editing room we will try a lot of different versions of scenes and he will screen them for audiences and record their laughter and then compare waveforms of laughter uh, from one audience to another and make changes and see if the waveforms go up or down and look for scientifically what made that joke funnier. And he found he get, one specific example he told me about, which I include in the book is he said he, there was a joke he knew should be funny and it wasn't getting the laugh he wanted. So he went back and examined the timeline in the editing system and he found that there was a sound effect on the moment that was out of sync. So he put the sound effect back in sync, beefed it up a little bit, and got the laugh he was looking for. And so sometimes it's it's a very technically specific thing like that. And other times you have no idea. Larry David really has no idea. He says, I don't know why pretty, pretty, pretty good is funny, but it's funny. <laughs> yeah. Pretty, 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 pretty good. 
he goes on <laughs> instinct. And so yeah. he's got a natural instinct for what he thinks is funny. And luckily for him and for me, other people, audiences agree mm -hmm. that, that those things are funny. So you can analyze, you can have instinct, both require uh, a good editor who has an understanding of story structure and comedy structure to help refine scenes and make them make them the funniest version of whatever that material that you're presented with can be. Yeah, I think editors, I mean, it's probably a lot of people. I always think of like, say, Formula One, that you think of the big names in Formula One like Michael Schumacher, but there are a lot of technicians behind the scenes who make him as good as he is. And I think we'd like Larry David and, and Sash Baron Cohen. The editing can make or break them to make them look good. But obviously, they you, you say that they're very particularly involved in what you're doing to make sure that it is as funny as it can be. Sasha Baron Cohen is. Larry David um, doesn't do anything. Larry, Larry will test screen an episode once and he doesn't, there's a little talk afterward, question and answer. What did you think? Uh, did, did this story point land? But what he's looking for is actually he's feeling the room during the screening. It becomes apparent for the first time when you see it with an audience, if something is, uh, the energy is there that you want mm -hmm. or it's falling flat. And after we do one screening, it's very clear, okay, that joke didn't work, it's gotta go. We thought it was funny, but it wasn't, it didn't work. And so you do need to feel, it's a different perception when you watch something with a group of people, when you watch it with other people, then when you, you, you know, if you, even though you created the joke and you have an idea for how this will work, you don't, you don't know until you test it. So that is an essential part of the, the comedy process. And as well as, like on Curb Your Enthusiasm, Larry lets me, I cut the episode however I want to. I take the scenes that they've shot and the, like maybe they've done seven or 10 or 11 takes. I, and each one's different. I build the scene in the way I think is the funniest and present it to Larry. We watch it together and then we watch all the footage together, Larry and I from start to finish and he'll see things. Oh, let's try that joke. And, and maybe can you squeeze that in? So we'll try to jam in some other things that he's found in the footage. And now we've got a really big bloated cut. And then it's a process of cutting it down to time and, and removing things until it con condenses to its best version. But he totally relies on me to present um, a, an ideal workable best version of the scene. And it's uh, editing improv comedy is the most difficult of all the, the jobs I've had as an editor. Okay, because because I know you did the comedy store, which I don't think we've ever got over here in the UK. But was that mostly improvisation? Then was it or the comedy store is a documentary <laughs> series that is about this place called the Comedy Store in Los Angeles, where all the big names in comedy, you if you look back, came okay. through this one comedy club, one of the earliest of its kind, and it's a five episode series. And all these people are interviewed from David Letterman to Jay Leno. Okay. Um, you know, some of them are, you know, are, are no longer with us. Um, um, but uh, of all the co comedians who are still alive who came through that store, they tell their stories about what it was like in the beginnings and how they got to where they are today. Okay, sorry. Like I say, I like I say because we never got it over here. I I I thought it was kind of like another one of those sort of mockumentaries of the thing, but it's actually just more of a documentary about this particular story itself. Yes, and all the comedy uh, comedians and 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 about comedy and what's funny. Yeah, fair enough. Do you think? And um, just coming back to one of the program, the other programs that you worked on, Veep. Now I know that was created by Armando Antonucci, uh, who I think is genius and um, he created a character over here i don't know if you've heard of called alan partridge um i i genuinely think alan partridge is is pure comedy genius he's again funny enough in that mockumentary style do you think there's much of a difference between british comedy and american comedy i've tried to emulate british comedy ever since i discovered monty python i think uh. that's the the funniest probably the funniest television show or comedy uh whatever it is it, it, sketch comedy show ever devised when i first discovered it in the when i was growing up in the 70s i couldn't believe it i'd, I'd never seen anything like it and i thought it opened my eyes to what was possible what could be done and 
I, when I was interviewing all of the showrunners I worked with, whether it was David Mandel, who took over for Armando on Veep, or Jeff Schaefer and, uh, and Larry David on Curb Your Enthusiasm, and Sasha Baron Cohen, and Alec Berg, who, who created a show called Barry and Silicon Valley, and, and, and a lot of the editors I worked with, one of the um, constants I discovered is everybody knew of or had seen Monty Python when we were growing <laughs> yeah. up, and it influenced all of us. And you know, it 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 flows. You know, the the waves of influence go back and forth and around the world. And everybody, uh, like punk rock, starts here, then it spreads there, and now it's everywhere. And then it becomes grunge, and then it you know that becomes uh, uh, death metal or whatever. But influences go all directions. And I was a, a huge fan of the British style of comedy when I was growing up, and I found out a lot of the comedy writers who are in Hollywood now or, or uh, had the same influence, mm. you know, they'll refer to in meetings, they'll revert to, re, they'll say, thing, oh, that's a dead parrot sketch, or that's a dead <laughs> parrot, you know, referring to yeah. the dead parrot, you know, uh, it's not dead, it's she's, it's sleeping. Um, <laughs> they invented the, the pythons invented so many things that we now utilize as in comedy. And it's almost become to, part of culture. Uh, completely. And we try yeah. to take it to the next step. And there's a lot of people that are taking things to the next step and are just as funny in, in its own right. And there's so many TV shows that are, you know, very funny in their own right, but um, you can see antecedents and the Pythons have antecedents in the Marx brothers. Mm. And one of the things I interviewed jo Julian Doyle, who was an editor of the Python movies uh, for the book. And I asked him about that. And he said that one of the things that Monty Python did was they would punch up, you know, the best comedy takes the piss out of the judges and the police yeah. and the businessmen, the, the upper class, you know, you don't punch down. It's easy to punch down and make yeah. fun of people who are less able than you are. But if you take on those who are the ruling class and above you and, and ahead of you, that's one reason for their success mm. and mean, they got that from the the marx brothers did that the marx brothers were, were brilliant at that yeah i mean monty python if, if you didn't know um the holy grail word perfect by the age of 12 you were ridiculed by all the kids at school <laughs> um and i, I there, it's, there was a connective tissue also between it called the goon show oh yes very big fan of the goon show yeah it was kind of that uh, uh, what's the word anarchic Comedy, I think it's it is funny because watching Monty Python, if you watch the very first episode, there are laughs in it, but the audience aren't quite sure what they're watching. And they're kind of laughing and sort of going, is this funny? Because I think everything before that had been so sitcom and, and that kind of thing, whereas they came along with jokes that were just completely and utterly out there. And I don't think the uh, at first the audience completely understood it. <laughs> Well, no, it's often described, Monty Python is described as surrealistic comedy. Hmm. And they were influenced by Bunuel, and hmm. which is essentially comedy. You know, existentialism is comedy because it's absurdity. It's the universe sending out the message daily that there's no point to everything. Everything is absurd. It's a big joke. The universe yeah. is an absurd joke played on all of us. <laughs> and then that filters down into uh, cinema and television and comedy writers. Mm. It is like I say, I, I, I could sit here all evening talking about Monty Python because they've they are just wonderful. And like I say, I think I probably know most of the sketches off by heart because again, my dad was one of those people that was, no, you're gonna watch Monty Python, you're gonna enjoy it. And I'm so glad he did. I actually worked with some younger lads who've never seen like Life of Brian or, or Holy Grail, and I've told them that you that it's kind of it's essential viewing as far as I'm concerned for, for anybody. What, what was your most pivotal pivotal memory of monty python the funniest sketch for you uh, weirdly enough it was the very first episode of the um oh the guy who laughed himself to death who wrote the funniest joke in the world that's right he, he wrote a joke that was so funny that he, he reads it and then he death. keels over right and yeah. then somebody else picks it up and reads it and they keel over and then they start it, using it in war they throw it across yeah. it and, and it kills and the enemy the, 
they're running across these work things shouting in, in German. And apparently the actual joke in German doesn't mean anything. It's it's <laughs> nonsense. Because I got I had a friend who was German. I said, What is that joke? And he said, It doesn't it doesn't make any sense. So it's it's German sounding words. But the bit that got really got me, I don't know why I still find this funny, but it's a bit where they said that they started translating the words. And one man read two words of the joke and spent six months in hospital. And you're just sort of thinking, how can two words go together that are so funny that they put you in hospital, you know? And, it, <laughs> and I, I think also with Monty Python, I also found that it was just a very intelligent humour that what they did. It wasn't just slapstick comedy, which, I mean, some of it was, but also some of it was very deep rooted in sort of, you know, historical excellence and that kind of thing. And I just, again, it kind of said to me that, I grew up on like Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd and all this kind of thing. And sort of, you know, a man getting hit and falling over is, is, is funny. I hate to admit it, but I watched Jackass forever the other day and I did giggle all the way through because it was just funny to see the, see the guys doing what they were doing. But it's also that in, in t- comedy can be very intelligent and can be very, you know, you can actually have a real, not a serious point, but you can actually sort of educate with comedy as well. Oh yeah, the pythons were filled with with uh, erudite moments where they would refer to um, famous writers and literary greats as part of a joke, which yeah. they didn't wait for the audience. You had to keep up with them. Yes, again, that, again, that's something. I, I again another joke that stands out to me is a really weird one. But in The Simpsons, um, they're driving somewhere and it says next stop. Uh, Denny's is is 100 miles away. Then Denny's is 50 miles away. And Bart goes, can we stop at Denny's? And he goes, no. And then they drive past it. And then the sign says Denny's is uh, uh, 25,000 miles away. And it was only a a few years afterwards that I learned the circumference of the earth was 25,000 miles. (laughs) And again, it's kind of, I don't know why it hit me, but again, I, I think it's just wonderful when people can be very intelligent with their comedy as opposed to, like some people, like I've said, that just resort to just seems like if you just swear a lot, that seems to be funny. I don't, I don't, I'm not a, not a fan of that kind of humor well that's the easy joke and yeah. it wears off very quickly it, its effectiveness very quickly abates and it, so if that's what you rely on you, you're going to be very short-lived as a comedian yes yeah that's 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 very very true what was your first memories of monty python then well the, the funniest sketch to me ever was about it was a parody of sam peckinpah where a guy runs out and goes, tennis, anyone? Do you remember that? Days. Yes. Somebody, yes. Yes. Sal, yes. Salad days of Sam Peckinpah. And he, somebody throws a tennis ball, it hits him in the eye and blood starts spurting out of his eye. And someone's playing the piano and they close it on his hands and he lifts his hands up and he's been, his hands have been severed and blood is spraying everywhere. And they're all wearing white tennis shirts and there's blood everywhere. And I, I had never seen anything like it. I couldn't believe it. It just, you know, it changed my perception of what was funny. Another one that one of the editors, John Korn, who was an editor who worked on Curb Your Enthusiasm, I asked him this very question, and he said, confuse a cat was the thing he remembered most, (laughs) where a cat was depressed, and so they had to try to undepress the cat, you know, by by trying to confuse it. With these just utterly bizarre feats of like men in dustbins and a boxer hitting a policeman, and there was kind of this utterly bizarre. Again, I just don't think... I mean, somebody had to start that somewhere, but I just don't think Britain was kind of ready for that comedy when it first came out. It was it was so out there, whereas nowadays, like I say, it's kind of, like you say, keeping up with, with everything is actually much, much harder. Do you think that then, because of that, people like Larry will always go on making stuff and the same with, like, Sasha Baron Cohen and so forth? Well, they're always pushing the envelope. They're trying to be ahead of everybody. And so when you watch something some that they do to be successful you want some people to be angry pissed off confused and because you're so far ahead of everyone else and and leading the crowd you want to be leading the crowd not trying to follow the trend yeah exactly roger thank you so much for talking to us really appreciated like i say we're going to put up a link to your book uh, for people to have a look at and then um when is trekkies due out on blu-ray and dvd uh the, mid-may the, uh may of 2022 yeah it'll be out uh, available again finally fantastic um we will certainly um build it up on the last movie outpost because uh, a you've been so nice to us and b i think it's just one of those documentaries that people should watch because i mean there are people that are going to watch it and think these people are sad but at the end of the day they have got heart and an obsession in something which is not hurting anybody you know and it's it's a wonderful thing 
You know what I used to do when Trekkies first came out? I would tell people who hadn't seen Trekkies yet, I would say, this is going to be the funniest thing you have ever seen in your life. <laughs> You've never seen anything as funny as this documentary, Trekkies. You're going to laugh harder at this than you've laughed at anything in your life. I would build it up as high as I possibly could and raise their <laughs> expectations, which is the opposite of what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed yeah. to lower expectations. So they go, oh, that was great. And no matter how high I raised the expectations, they always said, man, that was funnier than I expected. <laughs> So I, wow. I, it was an experiment. I could never raise it high enough that they were <laughs> let down by how funny this film is because it's these people, there's nobody funnier than Star Trek fans. Yeah. Uh, like I say, I think they're a wonderful group. You know, I think anybody who is, who is obsessed about something like that, especially sort of like with movies and so forth, there's nothing really to be said against bad against them because as I said, they're not hurting anybody and they are fascinated with something which they love. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I don't understand football fans. I could not, stand for 90 minutes and watch people kicking a ball around the field i do not understand that and so like i say everybody's got their passion and trekkies is one of those films which really shows off people's passion and it was it was a real treat to watch well i love star trek fans and, and i say that with the greatest respect and honor to them that they are so amazing and that they can be so uh engaging and funny i mean football is ritualized warfare it's cathartic because instead of going out and, and fighting in battle, you get to watch people in an arena yeah. do pretend battle and you yeah. get it out of your system. So that's this, you know, that's it serves that purpose. And Trekkies is, is, is a, the purpose it serves is to understand your fellow human being while laughing and enjoying laughing with them mm. at what's absurd yeah. about the universe. Yeah, because I mean, they even know how kind of crazy it was, isn't it? That, like, say, that one chap who was dressed up as a commander. You know, he said that he wouldn't get his ears done, even if he could afford it. But I mean, again, he didn't, you know, he knew it was kind of ridiculous, but he knew also he was putting a smile on people's faces. He's reveling in it. He mm. loves it. He loves the attention. I mean, anyone who goes out in public in a uniform, whether it's <laughs> sports or Star Trek, they're doing it for attention. They want to advertise. I'm a part of this group and mm. this is my outward display to show you that this is what I think or feel or believe in. And so they want you to see that and they, they enjoy it. They love it. Oh, it's brilliant. Roger, like I say, thank you so much for joining us at the last movie outpost. Um, hopefully you've got some more projects on the go and if you ever do, please reach out to us, but uh, thank you very much. I do. And I will. Thank you.